All right, in continuing to follow our course outline, today is the day we're going to get our first proving ground turned in. And for digital honors, you're working on just the full cast sheet, like all the components of the cast sheet, the vector line art, the coloring. So for our first proving ground, proving grounds are a little different. So just a quick review from what we were working on last week and last class. These were the, the videos we did that you can find in the class YouTube. There are three components to this proving ground. This proving ground is, is meant to help us identify patterns in creative work. And the reason it's our first proving ground, you'll find it all in unit six, is because before you can make good decisions creatively, before you can solve problems creatively, you need to acknowledge the potential of the things you have. You have to identify patterns within them. In digital art, that means understanding your, your resolution and the potential that resolution has. It means understanding the, the capabilities you have in compositing to match things like lighting angle, to play with things like atmosphere, coloring, all the things we've done in compositing, and to even change the perspective on your creature a little bit to fit with the setting. So this is not an assignment because we're using things we've already built, but by doing three different requirements, you're going to show that you've really thought about those things you've created, right? So the first thing we're going to do is you're going to take your creature and you're going to put it into an environment and you're going to try to angle its anatomy to fit within that scene. Sometimes that means you might need to, to crop it into a smaller area, right? Because you want the creature to be showcased but with at least 20-25% of the overall scene, if not bigger. The second thing you're going to do is you're going to acknowledge and identify the patterns in its resolution. So resolution is the number of pixels, right? That's called the pixel dimension. But resolution is just a number of pixels doesn't help you understand its potential. So when we look at an image, and we just see it for an image on the screen. It's like looking at a, a photo of one of our relatives from a certain time and place. But when we actually see that relative in person, we can actually acknowledge that they are a living being with potential. They can go on to do things. So not just looking at the image and seeing it for what it is in that moment, but seeing what it can become. That's what acknowledging and writing the resolution is. So when we look at our image, we're going to look at its physical dimensions at one of two resolutions. We're going to learn what standard print resolution is, which is 300 pixels per inch, and what standard screen resolution is, which is 72 pixels per inch. And we're going to pick which one of those gives us an image that's larger than, than 8 by 10 inches. right? And as long as it's larger than 8 by 10 inches at one of those resolutions, we're good. Then you also are asked to identify it because if it's print resolution, 300 pixels or, or at 8 by 10 or larger, that means that it has a lot more pixel resolution potential to be used in the world. And if it's limited to screen, that just lets us know that it's not able to be printed at the sizes we might want it to be. But it can be shown on phones, on websites, on screens. And then the third thing you're going to need to do, and Students get confused by this. It's not a creative writing class. But why are we asked to, to write about how our creature exists in its environment? Well, because we don't often make connections unless we force our brain to, right? And one way to force our brain to recognize connections is to articulate them. So I'm asking you, no matter how unusual your creature is, and no matter how unusual your environment is, you will find connections between them by just articulating them articulating how the creature exists in this environment. What does it breathe? What does it eat? How does it shelter? How does it uh, hide from predators? That kind of thing. And that's going to help you see connections you might not have seen before. So all of this is under the premise of I identifying patterns. So how do we prove this? By meeting each of these rubrics. Right. So the first thing we need to do is actually make our creature scape because this second part of the rubric, we want to get full marks. We want to match 
the light direction of our creature and environment. We also want to match the angle of anatomy. So if I open up my files, I'll go ahead and drag it to the desktop. Open that up. This is the one you keep in your documents folder. I want to open up my proving ground folder. And then I want to open up a new browser window for PhotoP because we're using freeware to composite this, but we could use Photoshop as well. Then I'm going to drag my PSD file into PhotoP. And what we've done so far is we brought the creature in, we tried to match the angle, and we did that, and we tried to match the lighting, and we first did that by introducing atmospheric layers, these texture overlays. And then how did we meet, match the creature's angle? Well, I just used Command T, Option Command T, sorry. In, and you can see how my box is a little skewed here. That's because I used Distort to try to match the, the feet to the, the shallow kind of pond that it's standing in. And I like that its wing could overlap the, the rocks there to kind of showcase it. And in this way, I am showcasing my creature, and my creature is taking up 20, 25% or more of the overall picture plane. And I can choose which layer in the scene my creature is sitting. So it's sitting behind the foreground rocks. And then I even decided to turn off some of these, these aspects. Like, I don't think I need these necessarily. I think I can let this background kind of lead right into my creature. And then we learned some non-destructive overlay layers. So we use them to create shadows. So what is a non-destructive overlay layer? If I get rid of the atmosphere so you can see, it is building a shadow onto the background in a way that doesn't hurt the pixels in the background. So what I did was I created a new layer and I said edit fill with gray, middle gray. To do edit fill is the only like easy way to get absolute black, absolute white, and absolute middle gray. I'm just going to say the blend mode normal, opacity 100%, keep all the defaults here, but once it's in, I'm going to change its blending mode from normal to overlay mode. This is why it's called a non-destructive overlay layer. Because any dodging and burning I do to that gray is going to affect the layer underneath. And the layer that's underneath is the setting. Right? So, if I burn... which darkens the pixels available. This is still compositing because we're not painting pixels. We're modifying ex existing pixels. Whenever I use dodge and burn, I want to use a large brush with 0% hardness. I want to make it pressure sensitive with my tablet. And I want it to be an exposure of less than 20 because it's a very strong tool. And if I know I want there to be a shadow underneath my creature based on the lighting angle of the scene, because on my scene here, change it to overlay mode, the lighting's coming from behind, right? So the shadow is going to be underneath my creature, like so. Now what I'm actually doing is I'm burning that gray layer, but because it's set to overlay mode, that simply darkens what's underneath. And then I can always play with opacity and decide how much is necessary. Then I also have some foreground elements in front, and then I have my atmosphere as well, which gives me that kind of steaminess. But before we add that, all of that just kind of helps. How else can I match the angle of my creature's anatomy into the scene? Well, right now it looks like they're standing on top of the water. I want them to be standing in the water. So an easy thing to do is to internally composite. And the way I do that is I take a chunk of this water from my background layer with my lasso. 
and then I duplicate it, Command-J. And then I move that on top of my creature layer. Now, water is not like dirt, right? If my creature was stuck in quicksand, that might be a good way to, to show where they're cut off. It's a much better th way than erasing away from my creature, right? You can always composite more layers, but because water is transparent, I can just take the opacity down on the water and reveal the feet underneath. And then I can actually play with the lighting on my creature to show that it will get darker as it's deeper underwater. So not only do I have this shadow on the water, and I can deepen that because I have this the other one I did, which helps, but I can actually start to darken my creature as well. So this is the next phase. Once you have your creature believably angled in your environment with its anatomy, now it's time to get its lighting to match. More than just with atmosphere, though that definitely helps. Right. So what do I do? I'm going to take my creature layer, and I am just going to make a simple duplicate of it, Command-J, and then I'm going to rasterize the duplicate. The reason I marked my creature layer as green is so I can see how many of them I end up with by the end. Now, on that duplicate, I can dodge and burn directly. So this is a tool adjustment, right? Instead of using levels as a direct adjustment to the whole layer, I'm using my burn tool and my tablet, and I'm burning the shadow, especially of the feet that are under the water, right? Because light is having to do a lot more to get, get down there. Now, here's the problem with doing it directly on the creature. It can be helpful, but like we've seen dodge and burn before, sometimes it can really intensify the saturation. And sometimes it can go too far, and it can get really, really dark very quickly. But that's why we did it on a duplicate. So if, if we ever took it too far, we could always adjust it with opacity. So maybe that's the amount of, of burning I want on it. Now, how do we adjust for the things being too saturated, right? Because sometimes burning can intensify it. Well, then you use the sponge tool, and you can set that to desaturate. Again, pressure sensitive. Again, less than 20. And again, a brush that's large and soft. And I can just hit these really brightly colored areas just a little bit so they don't seem too out of place with the interior of the cave. And again, if I think, feel like I do that too much, I can take down my opacity a little bit. Now, that is destructive. What I just did was make a duplicate of my layer, and now there's just a little haze of it that was dodged and burned that's now overlapped on my original creature layer. Another way we could do it is we can make a duplicate of our original creature, and then we can rasterize it, and then we can use our magic wand, and we don't even need to have contiguous checked, we can select around it, the empty space. And I'm doing this with a one pixel feather. Now I'm going to say select the inverse. So now it's selecting just the shape inside my creature. And now I'm going to say Edit Fill with Middle Gray. So now I'm going to do a non-destructive overlay layer of my creature. And you see how it maps right on top. Now I can map the dodging and burning I did from before onto it. Or I can dodge and burn directly onto this. The sponge tool isn't going to do anything because it's already gray. But if I, sometimes students find this helpful. If I dodge and burn while it's still on normal mode, 